following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The study of Gnosis is concerned with a very special form of knowledge. When we say the word Gnosis, what we're referring to is not the kind of knowledge that you can read or that you can acquire from a book or a lecture. But Instead, this knowledge refers to something that one acquires by one's own experience. It's important for this definition of gnosis to be maintained in a clear way within the mind of the student. For without it, the study of the doctrine of Gnosis can quickly become mere dogma or belief. It can remain as a theory. One of the central postulates of any Gnostic tradition, wherever that wisdom has appeared in the world, has always been know thyself the acquisition of knowledge of oneself, which is, in fact, the central basis or central ground from which the path is discovered. It's a very easy way for any student to begin to study and explore the wisdom of Gnosis and to maintain this information merely in the intellect. This is very common and very easy. Likewise, the student may gather and maintain this information merely as a belief, as something they hold dear in their heart. And this also is common and easy. Or a student may adopt the point of view, the practices, and certain types of habits that they learn from the Gnostic doctrine and maintain those simply as habitual or mechanical behaviors. And this is also easy to do and common. These three fundamental mistaken paths relate to our three fundamental brains or psychic intelligences, psychic computers, if you will, or aspects of our psyche that function as machines, that function in a predetermined way with specific energies and towards limited goals These three 
and their conjunction form a machine that we call the human-like machine. These three are the psychological aspect of an enormously complicated organism. A very complex and sophisticated and intricate mechanism. Each of us is extraordinarily lucky. We have been gifted with the most spectacular device that exists on this planet. And yet we fail to realize it. This device we received free from our parents. It has within the capacity to transform the universe. It has within itself abilities and powers which the vast populace does not even begin to suspect. And yet, we remain ignorant of its function and its potential. This human-like machine, this body that we inhabit, and its psychological aspects, has such tremendous power and abilities that only few have realized. In the history of our race, our humanity, there have been a few individuals who have risen above the crowd and have become noteworthy. And typically, these types of individuals appear as miraculous to the uninitiated hordes of human-like machines. These very unique, true individuals are beings such as Buddha, such as Mozart, such as Beethoven, Krishna, Plato, Shakespeare. These are individuals who, to some degree or another, were able to realize more of the capacity of the machine that their consciousness inhabited. And this in itself underscores one of the fundamental factors of learning how to best utilize this human-like machine, and that is to realize it is not ourself. It is a device, a machine, a mechanism, an organism that is utilized by other forces. This human this human-like machine, this organism that has the appearance of being human, is just a machine that needs to be directed, that needs to receive instruction, that is, in essence, controlled by some other factor or force. Those individuals who have stood out in the course of time, such as Beethoven or Mozart or Jesus, are individuals who learned how to awaken the consciousness, how to utilize the consciousness itself as the commanding intelligence to dominate and best use this organism that we inhabit. This is actually the whole reason, the whole purpose of the existence of all the ancient mystery schools. If we look and study into any ancient mystery school, such as the Essenes, the Greeks, the ancient Aztecs, the Tibetans, 
any of the ancient mysteries, we discover that their primary message was intensely psychological. This psychological uh, point of view or message was always veiled or delivered through symbolism, through metaphor, through analogy. Thus, if we study, for example, the Greek mysteries, we may discover that amazing and deeply insightful story of Cupid and Psyche, of which there's a beautiful rendition in the book by Apuleius called The Golden Ass or The Metamorphosis of Lucius. And this is an ancient Gnostic novel which contains a very potent but very modern story. A very important psychological teaching. And I recommend that you read and study this book. But in the middle of the book, Apuleius tells the story of Cupid and Psyche. And within that myth, you discover a profound teaching about the nature of our consciousness. The gist of the story of the golden ass is about a man named Lucius who is quite vain and quite pleased with himself, who has a strong curiosity about magic. He also has a very strong, lustful passion. The combination of these factors leads him to a situation where because of his lust and his naivety, he becomes transformed into an ass, a donkey. And from this moment, he enters into the most disturbing, extensive series of suffering, different events within which he suffers terribly, again and again and again. Lucius is a symbol of you and me. Lucius is a symbol of any intellectual animal that becomes hypnotized or under the control of the desires of the animal mind, that animal mind that we have within. Lucius, in this story, is controlled by his lust, by his curiosity, by his vanity, by his pride. And these, of course, appear in the screen of his mind through his three brains. These three brains are the vehicles through which psychological impulses manifest. They are also the vehicles through which external impressions are received and transformed. These three brains are machines each of which has a specific function and a limited potential. So in our story of Lucius, we see how this person who had the potential to become a great person instead became victimized by his own desires and due to karma due to cause and effect, in other words, he transformed himself into an animal and thus suffered intensely. I won't spoil the ending of the book for you because the ending is fantastic. But what's important for us is to understand that we ourselves have become 
the golden ass, the donkey. We, like Lucius, are being tossed from situation to situation in life without any real ability to control our circumstances. We find ourselves in one circumstance after another and merely respond, react. But our potential to change those circumstances is incredibly limited. And part of the reason for this is that we don't have individual will. We think we do. We believe we have individuality. We believe we are an integral person, one, unique as a whole. But if we become really sincere with ourselves, really observe ourselves, we can see that this is not true. From one moment to the next, our will is constantly changing. In one moment, we may feel the impulse, the craving, the urge to eat. And perhaps we're attracted to a particular kind of food. And the whole organism reacts and responds to this. And we feel the hunger. We imagine that food. We want it. And we begin to plan how to get it. But then, in the next moment, we feel a different desire, even a contradictory one. Perhaps we feel we want to be skinny. We want others to like our appearance. So then we say, no, I can't eat that chocolate cake. And then we begin to feel and to be driven by that impulse to develop our vanity. And then the next moment, we feel a desire to buy something, to go shopping. And then the moment after that, we have another contradictory desire to stay in bed and sleep or to watch TV. These sort of seemingly unimportant changes of direction reflect a very significant psychological scenario. And this scenario is called the doctrine of the many eyes. This doctrine of the many eyes states that we do not have a single eye, we have a legion of them. And this legion of eyes is constantly in battle to take control of our human machine, to manipulate our three brains in order to feed themselves. And this is how we can understand that in one moment we may be deeply in love with our boyfriend or girlfriend, our spouse. But then with a very small change of circumstances, we can feel complete indifference towards them or even hate. How else can we explain to ourselves this contradictory flux from one day to the next, from one hour to the next, where in one moment we're very happy with our job and in the next we hate it. And just a little while after that, we're indifferent. This constant back and forth of contradictory wills is what keeps us trapped as a victim of circumstances. We may find from time to time that we do develop a very strong desire or longing to make a change in our lives. Say, for example, we want a particular type of career. And we feel very enthusiastic about this career. We might spend months or even years training ourselves, studying, and learning about this career. And then one day, we don't like it anymore. We become indifferent. We even hate it. How is that? Is it true, this illusion we tell ourselves, that we simply 
changed our mind? Or is the truth so disturbing to us that we can't bear to face it? And that is, we never really wanted that career in the first place. An I did. An ego. An aggregate in our psyche desired that. Perhaps because of longing for security. Perhaps because that I wanted to be respected, to be admired, to be rich, to look different, or to follow in the footsteps of a person we admire. From moment to moment, from scenario to scenario, different desires, or stated another way, Different wills step in and take control over this human-like machine. And we, as a consciousness, remain asleep. We have this mistaken perspective that somehow we are a unity. And this illusion is there partly because of the nature of having a physical body. That being in a physical body, it feels like we're in a continuity. It also comes because we have a memory. And the nature of our memory is such that we naturally merge together all these contradictory events as one single flow. But we fail to recognize the true characteristics of that flow of events or circumstances within our psyche. In the Bible, this doctrine of the many eyes is presented in the form of a story. You may recall when Jesus arrives at a particular place, he encounters a man who's possessed. And in the Gospels it says, it was a man with an unclean spirit who lived among the tombs. Jesus asks this man what his name is, and the man says, my name is Legion. And Jesus, of course, rejects or ejects from this man all of those contradictory elements within him. This this story symbolizes how that universal compassion embodied in Jesus, that compassion that we call Christ, has the capability to clean our unclean spirit. To reject from our psyche all of those legion, those psychological elements that constitute what we also call the ego. It's in this way that we find and and discover that there is a way out of suffering. And that way out of suffering is to cleanse the mind, to eject from our psyche all of those discursive emotions, discursive thoughts, discursive impulses, which arrive into our mind, the screen of our mind, from our own subconsciousness, from our own unconsciousness, and the infra, or deepest levels of the consciousness. When we are capable of doing that, we can arrive at what's called individuality. Someone who is an individual has an individual will. An individual is someone who does not contradict themselves, who knows the will of their own inner being, their own inner Buddha, and acts on that will without contradiction. And this is a person like Buddha, like Jesus or Moses. These are human beings in the full sense of that word. These are people who learned 
how to control their own human machine. Consciously, with conscious will, no longer being driven by impulses. We learn that through self-observation, through self-remembering, through meditation. And we learn that by studying ourselves. We need to study Gnosis. We need to study the doctrine. We need to study the scriptures. But all of those studies are only there in order to give us fuel, to give us support for the study of our own selves. If we're not studying our own mind, we're wasting our time. If we're not really studying the function of our own psyche, we have not begin we've not begun to enter into gnosis. Because remember, as I said, gnosis is study of our own selves. When we observe sincerely our own life, when we watch our mind from moment to moment, we begin to become terrified. Because we see very quickly, that the mind is out of control. If you've tried to meditate to quiet your mind, to have a silent mind, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you have individuality and individual will, you should have the capability to sit and not think to be silent, to be serene, as a mind. But what you'll discover is that you don't have that. And that thoughts and feelings and impulses arise from your three brains constantly without your will. The recognition of this could drive you mad. If you really just watched your mind, just watched the impulses that come up constantly and how contradictory they are, and you really start to listen closely, you will hear and see and feel in yourself a whole legion of voices Voices that have different tones, different timbre, different characteristics. Some sound like men, some sound like women. Some cry, some shout, some whisper. Who is that? This is something for you to question about yourself. You may notice it most strikingly in those moments when you're falling asleep or waking, when external sensations are not so distracting and you're more submerged into your own interior psychology and you can feel and experience this cacophony of voices, all of whom struggle with each other in order to establish control over your machine. This is a very disturbing thing to face in oneself. It's very unsettling. It's very uncomfortable. And this is one of those causes that drives people away from self-knowledge. It's very painful to see the facts. Yet, if we cannot diagnose the disease, we cannot cure it. It is essential for you to see yourself as you really are. To recognize that we, each of us, are victims of this legion of our own mind. 
This is very important for beginning students in this study, in Gnosis. But it's equally important for students who've been around for a while. It's very subtle, but gradually, the more you become familiar with this doctrine, the more relaxed you can become about making effort. There are many who've been studying Gnosis for many, many years who have the illusion that they are knowing themselves, but they are not. It's easy to become hypnotized by the circumstances of life and by the various egos that feel very threatened by this knowledge. Yes, our mind is very threatened because Gnosis seeks to destroy the ego, to remove pride, to obliterate lust, to vanquish envy, to crush fear. And in that way, when all of these conflicting, discursive, filthy egos have been removed, what remains is the being. What remains is the consciousness. What remains is purity. When the ego is removed, what remains is the essence. The pure consciousness. The essence itself is the embryo of the real individual the embryo of the soul, that part of our psyche that can be grown and developed into a complete human being. The essence is the reflection of God. And it's those great prophets and angels and masters from all times who reflect to us the nature of our own essence. Conscious love innocence, tremendous intelligence, brilliant creativity, patience, happiness for others, temperance, fortitude. All of the real virtues emerge from the consciousness. There are some who say, if you destroy the ego, you destroy the person, you destroy the mind what's left. And these types of people don't understand that the ego and the being are different, like oil and water. The destruction of the mind means the destruction of the animal mind. The destruction of the I brings about the revelation of the true self, the real being which is beyond any kind of I, which is individuality that is beyond individuality. The true self, our true nature, is empty. Our true nature, our true I, has no I, but is individual. And though it seems contradictory, It is directly verifiable. It is something you can experience if you practice meditation seriously. If you dissolve your ego, if you conquer your desires. As we are now, we're tossed from circumstance to circumstance, from one form of suffering to another. Like a donkey, like an ass, who's tied to a stick, who doesn't see the rope or the stick, who sees in front of its eyes a carrot, and who wants the carrot. And that carrot could be anything. It could be a new car. It could be a career. It could be a baby or a child. It could be spiritual realization. It could be money or wealth. It could be fame. 
It could be success, whatever that means. Each of us is that donkey marching from day to day blindly and with a great deal of hypnotism pursuing this carrot that dangles before us that we can never seem to grasp. All the while not realizing that we're actually tied to a pole and all we do is walk in circles around and around repeating ourselves again and again, repeating our circumstances, repeating our sufferings. And all the while, the only result is we make that hole deeper. Every time we walk around the circle, we dig it deeper. The fact of this is ignored because it's too painful. We cannot face it because we love the idea that we can achieve our dreams. We love the dream that life can be what we want it to be. But it's a lie. So long as the ego is alive, we will be what our circumstances produce. We can do nothing. Because the ego is karma. The ego brings to us the results of our actions according to the law. The Bible says we will sow, we will reap what we sow. We receive what we give. We receive what we're due. So we repeat ourselves in cycles again and again. In fact, when you seriously begin to observe yourself, to study yourself, you discover that the vast majority of the feelings and thoughts that you had today, you had yesterday. The vast majority of the fears and concerns and worries that you have today, you had yesterday. And the day before that. And the day before that ad nauseum. What is new in our minds, in our hearts? Where is our will? This sad truth is nothing new. What I'm stating to you is an ancient truth which is contained within all of the religions in all the mystery schools. In fact, Shakespeare wrote about it. Very beautifully, but tragically, in Macbeth. The story of Macbeth is of a man who had tremendous potential to become a great leader, to become of tremendous benefit to Scotland, but who instead was misled by three sisters. These three sisters symbolize the three furies, the three traitors. If you've studied any religion, you've studied the three traitors. Jesus has three traitors. Hiram Abif has three traitors. Osiris has three traitors. All of the great religions. Because those three traitors represent the demons that inhabit our three brains. The demon of the intellect. The demon of the heart. And the demon of our instinctive motor and sexual center. These three sisters in Macbeth offer prophecies to Macbeth. And when those prophecies start to become true, he becomes convinced that these three witches have supernatural powers. And so he begins to trust them. But very significantly, 
his companion, Banquo, says that the powers, the intelligences of the darkness often give us truths only to later betray us of deeper consequence. And this is exactly what the ego does. Our own ego, always working to convince us of its authority, of its wisdom, of its importance, tells us things in our intellect about ourselves, about our future. It tells us things in our heart about ourselves, about our future, about our potentials. And it tells us things through our sexual center, our motor center, our instinctual center. This is where we get these thoughts and ideas about what we can become, about what life can be for us, about all the great things that we'll do in the future, about all our dreams. It is a very bitter medicine to become a little older and discover that it is all a lie. Some people discover that when they get a little older and reflect on their lives and find nothing has gone the way their mind told them it was going to go. Nothing. Not their brilliant career, not the great wealth they would acquire, not the fame, not all the friends, not the admiration, the success. And even if they got some of those things, it never comes the way the mind says it will. Because the mind is a liar. The mind is Satan, the father of lies. So Macbeth follows what his own three traitors tell him. And if you're familiar with the story, the outcome is tragic. At the very end, there's a part of him that realizes it. He doesn't change course because his ego is too strong. But he makes a statement that can only be made from the comprehension of this fact of life that the ego is a liar and as we listen to it, we waste our life. This is what Macbeth says in the play. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Truthfully, I tell you this, I read this to you with pain. It is painful to see the realities of life. A life lived under the sway of the illusion of the animal mind, this legion of egos that controls humanity. To see all of the children who are being indoctrinated with this false idea, who are not being taught about the consciousness, about how to awaken their own consciousness, who are being taught instead to celebrate lust, to enjoy their anger, to be entertained with violence, and to cultivate envy and greed. These are the values of our current civilization. These are the things that we celebrate and love. And the result is suffering. The result is the mass of confusion and chaos that we now furtively attempt to deny. 
We all are grasping desperately to the idea that somehow life is going to get better. When in fact, from week to week, it's getting worse. From month to month, life is becoming more difficult, more complicated, more contradictory. And this is because that is what's happening with the ego. The ego itself is not organized in any way. The ego has no coordination at all. Now, there are some schools who believe that it does, who believe that you can map or structure the ego. But the fact is, the different elements of the ego emerge in our mind only because of circumstances. And when circumstances change, new egos emerge. There is no pattern except chaos. There is no structure except a riot. That riot is our own psyche. The solution is to begin to pay attention to it. To come to understand that this human-like machine has, cap- has capacities, enormous capacities, but that have to be harnessed by conscious will. Even science nowadays tells us that we only use a very small percentage of the brain. And the percentage varies. sometimes a little more. But neuroscientists all recognize this universally and are perplexed. How is it that of all of the beautiful and intricate systems within our organism, the one we don't use is the brain? The one that we don't understand, the one that we take for granted, and that is underdeveloped and underutilized, is the brain, which, incidentally, we all think is our real identity anyway. How curious it is that we think we are the brain, and yet we only use a small percentage of it. All of the mystery schools teach how to awaken the consciousness. When the consciousness is awakened then we start to use the human organism to its full capacity. We start to use the entire brain. We start to use all of the glands, the endocrine system and the nervous system. We awaken subtle centers of transformation that exist throughout the seven bodies that we have. And in that way, open up senses that up to now have been dormant, ignored. This is how we can understand those great prodigies like Mozart. I invite you to study Mozart. To listen to the music. But more incredibly, to look at how he wrote it. To actually look at the documents of where he wrote the music down. And you will see he didn't erase anything. He wrote it down once. He didn't sit and think about it and say, oh, maybe I'll try this and maybe I'll try that. He heard the music inside and then he wrote it down. That's all. All the great composers have stated that that is how their greatest works have come to be. They themselves did not write it. They were only machines that transformed it. The consciousness, when awake, can perceive other dimensions, can perceive things beyond mere physical matter. 
The consciousness can see and hear and sense the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, seventh dimension. This is how Beethoven, Mozart, Wagner, the other great composers, heard their music, received that music through the three brains consciously and transcribed it. This is why the, all the great artists, the really great artists, say, I am but the pen of God. This is the goal, the purpose of this human organism. The purpose of this marvelous machine is not simply to be born, to fornicate, to have children like rabbits and then die. That would be truly sad if that were the point of life. The point of it is to become a human being, a real human being, one that can see and reflect and interact with the cosmos. The great prophets have all reflected that to us. Life does not have to be just suffering and pain. Life can be joyful, beautiful, very fulfilling. But it cannot be that if we remain hypnotized by our self-interest, by self-will. This is the other name for the legion, the self-willed. And that term can provide us with a great clue when we're self-observing, when we're observing our own mind. When we see elements arise in our thoughts, in our feelings, or in our impulses to action, we can analyze it. Who benefits? Who will benefit if I take the course of action that my mind is proposing? Who benefits? Who loses? The point of view of our modern culture is give me what I want. Our entire culture is focused on this. Fulfilling desire. Getting whatever it is we want. And yet, if you take a step back and you imagine for a moment a limited sphere or circle And you put within that circle a certain pile of goods. And all the people who are within that circle have the same idea. Give me what I want. The strongest, the fastest, are going to rush forward and take what they want. And some will get nothing. Who benefits? How long can that circle be sustained? If the resources are limited and a few are stealing all for themselves and leaving nothing for the rest, what will happen? The rest will die. The few will be left alone and they too will die. And what's left is nothing. Reciprocity is another word for karma. Everything in life is reciprocal, circular, cyclical. Every action that we perform has a consequence. Every direction that we choose has a consequence. When we take something, 
Who are we taking it from? Who benefits? Who loses? I'm not proposing that we should renounce all things. I'm proposing that we should become cognizant of what we use and why. Because at the moment, we are not. How else can we explain that the vast majority of the world's resources are concentrated in a very small number of places? For example, Americans... North Americans in general, can eat anything they want at any time. But the rest of the world does not have that benefit. Why? Who loses and who benefits? There is a fundamental disparity which is caused by the self-willed. We persist from day to day listening to the desires of the mind. As a friend told me, we live as slaves to our tongue. A slave to taste. If food doesn't taste it's sensational, if we don't love it, if we're not crazy about it, then we don't like it at all. We criticize it, we reject it, we won't eat it. And if you go to any restaurant in the Western world, you will see how people will send back food or not pay for food. When not too far away, there are people who have no choice, who eat things that Westerners would not even consider eating, wouldn't even touch it. I'm giving this as an example of the point of view of the ego. The ego is all about more and more and more. Give me more. Give me what I want. Self-willed. Selfish. And this fundamental point of view is what has caused the situation our world is in. Society does not exist separately from you or from me. Society is because of you and because of me. All of us long for a better society. And all of us want to change others to be the way we want them to be. And yet we cannot even change ourselves. It would be good. It would be beneficial for us to wake up to become conscious to begin to establish conscious control over this intellect and when thoughts arise to question them to not just go along with whatever we think but to question our thoughts where does this thought come from what does it want why am I always listening to these thoughts? Did I ask for this thought? Did I call this thought? To ask these questions of ourselves. And the same is true of emotions, feelings, likes and dislikes. Why do we feel antipathy for a person? Is it because we see something of ourselves in them that we don't want to see? Is it because we see something in them that reflects something that we have that we cannot bear? Do we really consciously comprehend why we feel the way we do? Why we have the desires that we do? Why we are attracted to certain kinds of emotional stimuli such as music or television or books? And likewise, impulses that arise in our action center, the motor instinctive sexual center. Why is the sexual impulse so powerful? Why are we such victims of the desire for sexual sensation? Why do we have no control? 
Why is it that this donkey is allowed to do whatever it wants? What about our impulses to overeat or to eat poorly or to be extremely picky? Or the opposite. There are people who are very proud of themselves when they get the latest fashion, when they get some new clothes, and they love how it makes them feel. They feel pretty, handsome, they feel new, they feel like they're ahead of everybody else. But this is vanity and pride. Standing next to them is another person who feels vanity and pride for wearing their old clothes. Who feels vanity and pride telling themselves, I'm better because I'm being more prudent. I'm saving my old clothes and reusing them. This is still vanity and pride. The ego is multifaceted. So long as we continue in all of our circumstances to be driven by the impulses of the animal mind, suffering will persist. So the solution for us is to learn about ourselves, to know ourselves, to be aware of what is arising within us, to not be a marionette, to become a real person, a real human being. Any questions? Um, I guess we have a misconception of um, mental projections. Um, the suffering we project onto others through the eyes, I guess, through the jealousy, um, pride, whatever could be, right? The scenario that we create that just because when I come in the physical action that we don't really receive common for that, or is really common minister community act or not, just by mental protection. The question is about whether there's karma for actions that occur in the mind. You have to understand that we exist in more than just the physical body. Because we're asleep, consciously, we've lost the ability to perceive the other aspects of our existence. This human-like machine that we exist within is multidimensional. It's not just physical. All of the energies that surge and process themselves through our three brains have components or aspects that are likewise multifaceted. So, for example, when a thought is processing itself in your physical brain, that thought has arrived from an ego. That ego exist in your own particular klipoth, or hell, which is part of the fifth dimension, the submerged part. And that thought is a reflection of the will of that ego. Energy and matter can never be separated. This is what Einstein pointed out to us. So when that energy of that thought is processing itself through your intellect... It has consequences. Everything has consequences, without exception. Your thoughts have consequences, but you just can't perceive it because you're asleep. When you awaken consciousness, then you can perceive that a thought is an energy which produces a result. Our mind is not a self-enclosed sphere. This is part of the illusion that we have related to this idea that we are an individual. We think that our mind is a self-enclosed unit and that within that space, 
We can think what we want. We can feel what we want. We can imagine whatever we want. But this is a lie. Whatever you think, whatever you feel, whatever you imagine affects others. How else can we explain those times in our lives when we have felt intuitively that someone is feeling a certain way towards us? There's no physical evidence. Say, for example, when you were a kid and you started to feel like one of the other children liked you. There's no physical sign because as children, we don't show things like that. But you can sense it. Or if you work in an office, you may have a coworker, and you start to sense something, to feel something. That's because the mind is not self-enclosed. We mix and blend with each other. When you think and feel things, there are consequences. Any other questions? Well, yeah, we need to become more cognizant of our actions. There's no question about it. And that includes our actions of thought and feeling. I'm giving an example. Many people who are in a marriage or in a couple are being indoctrinated with this cultural perspective now that it's okay for them to fantasize about having sexual acts with other people. As long as physically they don't do it. This is the idea. This is a lie. The physical body is just a vehicle in the physical world. Our emotions have their corresponding vehicle in the astral world. Our thoughts have their corresponding vehicle in the mental world. When we understand that the vehicles we inhabit have seven dimensions, the physical is just the lowest. And we're encouraging and indoctrinating each other with this idea that it's okay to fantasize about others. What we're doing is saying, it's okay to commit adultery. Because eventually, all of that energy in the mind will manifest physically. It's inevitable. As much as you fantasize and think about things and allow your mind to imagine, in this case, the sexual act with other people, what's happening is that you're training your mind that it's okay. And all that remains is that flimsy barrier to act on it physically. And you can see very easily that that barrier does not stand up when the desire is strong. And that's why adultery and fornication is so widespread. That's why so many marriages fail. Because people fantasize. Yes? Yeah, it says in the Gospel. If you've committed an act in your mind, you've committed it. It says that in the Gospel. Jesus says that. If you have committed adultery with the woman in your heart... You have committed the act. And this underscores the extreme difficulty of this work. Because our ego wants to indulge itself in all of its desires. And if it can't do it physically, it sure wants to do it in our fantasy, in our minds. Fantasy is an obstacle to comprehension. Fantasy is an obstacle to the awakening of the consciousness. Daydreaming is a form of hypnosis. It is a way of lying to ourselves and committing crimes. The function of imagination is critical because imagination is directly connected with sexual energy. 
And of course, you know that sexual energy is the most powerful energy that exists within our organism. We can see seven fundamental types of energy that exist within us. There's the physical energy, which is clear. There's vital energy or sexual energy, emotional, mental, the energy of will, energy of consciousness, and energy of spirit. But what is the most powerful one? What is the one that we have so much difficulty controlling more than any other but has the most power? Sexual energy. It is the one form of energy that gives us the power of God. And in the most superficial level, that power comes about when we join a male and a woman, a male and a female through the sexual act. And they have the power to create a child. That's the most superficial level of the use of sexual energy. There are levels above that and beyond that that are more powerful. And that's to use that sexual energy to transform the mind. And this is the basis of Tantra. To harness those forces to utilize them and direct them consciously to free ourselves from the legion. And that's what's symbolized in the story about Jesus. There was a question back here. Dreams that we have at night are a reflection of our state of consciousness. If we lack any control over our dreams at night, it's because we lack any control over our consciousness during the day. Between night and day, there is a continuity. The only difference is, at night, we let the physical body rest. That's the only difference. Your consciousness functions the same way but what happens is, because we're so asleep and because we're so hypnotized and identified with our ego, with the different desires that arise in us, when the physical body goes to sleep, we become totally entranced by all the manifestations of our mind. And in reality, what we dream is the interior of our mind. And that's why we have dreams about being at work, about going to church, about going shopping, about going here and there, and doing all the same things that we did during the day. If you want to take conscious control over your dreaming, take conscious control over your waking life first. Because by mat natural extension, if you become conscious of yourself during the day, then when your physical body goes to sleep, you will remain conscious of yourself. And then you can begin to exercise conscious will over your experiences while you're outside of the body. Anyone can achieve that if you make the effort. The problem is we want an easy answer. Everybody wants a simple trick or a magic pill that will awaken their consciousness in the astral plane. And nobody wants to make the effort to awaken physically. And that's because we want the sensation of being awake in the astral plane. This is the ego. It wants to experience the sensation of flying, of f moving through walls, of manipulating matter, the way you can do in the astral world. But if we instead start from the point of view that we want to change, to take control of our lives, to become a better person, then we'll start working here physically. And that work physically to become conscious of ourselves, to dominate the donkey mind, will start to reflect in our dreaming. Because we'll start to be awake during the process of dreaming and be able to take control over those dreams. Nonetheless, whatever we do, 
while dreaming, while in the astral world, whether we're conscious or unconscious, produces karma. Because every action on any level of existence has consequences. So if you're dreaming that you're committing a crime, in that world, you are committing a crime. And that's because in your mind, you have the element that can only commit that crime. So it becomes your responsibility to remove it. And that's why we study the dissolution of the ego. Any other questions? Yeah, well, how would you distinguish then when you're, I guess, uh, shown experiences by the God in terms you know, to interpret your dreams? You know, you'd be shown robbing some, uh, a bank, but really the interpretation could be something else for you. you know? Well, this is something that you have to develop through experience. It's one thing to watch the screen or the reflection of a past action or a potential action. And it's another thing to do the act. For example, when you're in meditation, if you've observed some impulse in yourself during the day that's disturbing, say, for example you felt extreme anger towards your spouse. This is very disturbing because we're supposed to love our spouse. And when you feel that kind of anger, anger is hate. Anger wants violence. This is disturbing to see, but we all have it. So if you are meditating on that and observing that, part of what you have to do is to replay that scene where that feeling emerged, the impulse emerged. So you have to review it to reflect upon it, to watch it. This doesn't mean that you're committing the action again. Unless you become identified with it and start to invest more emotional energy into it, like, yeah, I was right. I should be angry. Then you're making it worse. But if you can maintain that separation consciously to just observe the image, you're not contributing to the continuity of the crime. In fact, you're doing the opposite. You're beginning to extract what's valuable from it, to comprehend it. In this way, you can see that the consciousness has a power that's in some crude way similar to the power the body has to digest food. The body has the power to take food, to extract from it the elements that we need, and to dispel the rest, to eject the rest. The consciousness can do that with impressions, but we don't use it. And that's why the mind becomes so full of so much garbage. But when we start to activate that ability from moment to moment by observing, we start to clean the mind. And that doesn't mean that we're you know, contributing to those crimes in the mind. Any other questions? Each one of us has the potential, the great gift to become a human being. As difficult as life is, as painful, we have an unbelievable opportunity. In lectures like this and in studying the book, sometimes the knowledge and the information is very bitter and painful, and we don't like the taste. But we have to take our medicine. It's important. But it's important for us to realize that within each one of us is the seed of a Buddha, the seed of an angel. But that seed can only grow if the ego dies. Because a Buddha... An angel cannot have ego, cannot have lust or anger or pride or envy or fear, gluttony, greed, avarice, self-love, self-esteem, none of that. So we have that capacity, we have that potential, and this human-like machine that we inhabit at this moment is that vehicle that can take us there if we use it wisely. If we use all the energies 
in all of its levels, we can become that. Thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,